May of 2015, Pope Francis published Laudato Si on care for our common home, an encyclical on climate change, in which he says, I would like to enter into a dialogue with all people about our common home. This film marks the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si and will revisit some of the major insights of the encyclical while updating the climate issues in the years since 2015. In the film Laudato Si, A Canadian Response, Dr. David Suzuki was asked about the science behind Pope Francis's encyclical. What he has done is in the best tradition of Rachel Carson. Rachel Carson was a writer and what she did was look at the big picture. You know, generally we say, does DDT have an effect? Oh, well, what's the effect on this field? What Rachel Carson showed us was, yeah, you spray it on fields, but wind blows, and the, uh, it rains, and you end up affecting fish and birds and human beings. Generally, science, scientists are so focused, they're only looking at it in that little bit. What he has done is broaden it out. I think he's done something very, very profound. And uh, the science, as far as I'm concerned, is impeccable. At the December 2015 UN Climate Change Conference in Paris, Canada joined the 193 other countries in signing the accord and committing to a reduction in our greenhouse gas emissions. At one perilous moment in 2017, the Trump administration made a decision to pull the U.S. out of the Paris Accord, and Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the UN, responded. Climate change is a direct threat in itself but a multiplier of many other threats, from poverty to displacement to conflict. And the effects of climate change are already being felt around the world, and they are dangerous, and they are accelerating. And so my argument today is that it is absolutely essential that the world implements the Paris Agreement, and that we fulfill that duty with increased ambition. The world breathed a sigh of relief when, on January 20th, 2021, the newly elected American President Biden had the United States rejoin the Paris Climate Accord. Since 2015, the world has witnessed, among other things, the melting of glaciers in Greenland, which will dramatically contribute to rising oceans around the world, and wildfires in California, and Australia, with loss of property and dramatic loss of life and habitat for many species of animals. Protests around the world have brought the many aspects of climate change to the top of the political agendas in most countries. In 2018, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, sponsored by the United Nations Environment Programme, published a special report on the impacts of global warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The sobering projection presented by this comprehensive report is that the world has less than 10 years or until 2030 to avoid the most disastrous consequences of climate change if we can keep global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And if not... In May of 2020, the Dicastery, or Department for Promoting Integral Human Development at the Vatican, announced a special Laudato Si' anniversary year on the fifth anniversary of the prophetic encyclical. This film is a response to that invitation. Father Jostrom Isaac Carithadem, a Salesian priest and a cosmologist, is the coordinator of the ecology and creation sector of this dicastery and is often a spokesperson at international environmental conferences. His research contributes to a better understanding of the meaning of care for our common home. In his book, The Ten Green Commandments of Laudato Si, Father Carithadem employs a pastoral theological method, seeing, judging, acting. This methodology was developed by the Young Christian Workers Movement in Belgium in the 1920s. It is sometimes called the pastoral circle or the pastoral tree. It is, it's very important to see the situation, understand the situation in the light of the gospel and respond to the situation. 
and that's what you know Pope John the twenty third did it, did at the Second Vatican Council. He said we need to listen to the modern world, you know, to the challenges of today's world. Laudato Si uses the same method as illustrated in paragraph fifteen of the encyclical. I will begin by briefly reviewing several aspects of the present ecological crisis. I will then consider some principles drawn from the Judeo-Christian tradition. In light of this reflection, I will advance some broader proposals for dialogue and action. We will follow the same three-step method that has been used for over a century in Catholic social teaching. We begin with seeing, understanding the crisis facing our common home. For many years, we spoke about, about environment, and but environment is, you know, it's still outside of you. It doesn't touch you, whereas Earth is our home, and that makes all the difference. And also, it gives you a sense of urgency when your when your house is on fire. You don't sit back and say, "Okay, what can I do?" You 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 spring into action, you know, because it's your safety, the safety of your dear ones, and and in this common home, we all live together as a common family. So so and and so as a cosmologist, you know, it made a huge difference for me to begin to see Earth as a hill. Young and old alike seem to be responding to the notion that Earth is our common home by marching and demanding political leaders give global warming the attention it needs. One remarkable activist is a Swedish teenager named Greta Thunberg, who was 12 years old when the Paris Accord was signed. From strikes by school-aged children to a presentation to the UN, Greta's message is direct and memorable. Well, I will not stand aside and watch. I will not be silent while the world is on fire. Will you? And, and so the first thing we need to really listen to the cry of the earth and, and see the cry of the earth. Then, so in the 1980s or so, I'm reminded of Leonardo Boff, you know, whose famous book, 1992, if I'm not mistaken, Cry of the Earth cry of the poor, because uh, he, he said, you know, uh, and it's interesting, he, probably his merit was to put both these cries together. But at one stage, we realized that, you know, many of our brothers and sisters around the world are crying out, you know, famine in, in Africa or in Asia or, you know, many places and, and people suffering. And one mistake we made was to, to keep these two cries separate. I mean, like, you would have environmentalists, you know, who would, you know, who would, do, who would argue about, you know, protecting exotic species and, and who even literally, you know, drive thousands of miles to, to go into a wild play, you know, uh, wildlife area and, 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 and they won't be worried about, you know, children dying of hunger or poor people suffering. On the other hand, you have, you know, like people concerned about social justice and who thought environmental issues are meant for the elite. It's not for, about, you know, concerned about the poor. And that's, I think, I think, was a very crucial mistake we made. And we thought there were two issues. And people like Leonard the Boff tried to, you know, link them together. And, and Pope Francis has really changed the paradigm. You know, first, I, we spoke about, you know, Earth as our common home. That, I think, is the first paradigm shift that Laudato Si brings in. And the second paradigm shift is that all, both these cries are connected, you know, and, uh, and it is very true when, the, when this climate crisis the ones who are suffering are the poorest. Las redes de conexiones. Y nosotros estamos dentro de esas... Leonardo Boff is Brazil's best-known theologian, author of over 70 books on liberation theology, ecology, and spirituality. He is also the recipient of the Right Livelihood Award, often described as the alternative Nobel Prize. Here, he is the guest speaker in a webinar hosted by Dr. Mark Hathaway of the Jesuit Forum in Toronto in May 2020, the fifth anniversary of Laudato Si. Están en la base de una forma diferente de relacionarnos con la tierra, con la naturaleza y así garantizar un futuro a nuestra civilización. Porque así como estamos, no podemos continuar. 
porque hemos encontrado los límites de la tierra. No podemos ir más allá. El Papa llega a decir en su encíclica, es una mentira, mentira, dice. Pensar que la tierra tiene bienes y servicios ilimitados que permiten un proyecto de crecimiento ilimitado. Eso es una mentira. La tierra es un, un planeta pequeño, ya viejo, con bienes y recursos limitados, que no soporta un proyecto ilimitado. Por eso, por 35 veces, dice, hay que cambiar la, las formas de vida. Hay que cambiar las maneras de producir, de, de, de distribuir, de consumir. Tenemos que realmente hacer una revisión del camino que hemos hecho y empezar un nuevo comienzo, como dice la Carta de la Tierra. In his encyclical, Pope Francis drew our attention to many environmental concerns, including the issues of water, global warming, and the loss of biodiversity. We will examine these three issues as they stand today. Even as the quality of available water is constantly diminishing, in some places there is a growing tendency, despite its scarcity, to privatize this resource, turning it into a commodity subject to the laws of the market. Yet access to safe, drinkable water is a basic and universal human right. Maud Barlow, Canadian author and activist, one of the founders of the Council of Canadians, reflects on the current global freshwater crisis. Well, there are really two problems that come together around water. One is the actual lack of water itself. Um, we all learned back in about grade six that the planet couldn't run out of water, but that's not true. We are polluting it, diverting it, depleting it, <laughs> over extracting it, uh, damming it, uh, mismanaging it to the point where uh, we are quickly, quickly running out of clean, accessible water. The demand um, is due within, you know, 10 to 20 years. It, it, demand will outstrip supply by about uh, 40%, which just leaves millions and millions of people without. Um, and then we have reports of, say, like 21 cities in India, for instance, uh, are due to run out, including big cities like Delhi. So, I mean, we're talking a very, very serious issue around the actual water, the ecological crisis. Um, and then there's the human crisis, because, you know, where no matter where you live, if you've got money, you'll be able to pay for whatever water you think you need or you certain or you want. Um, but more and more, people who are disadvantaged, indigenous people, rural people, small communities, communities, villages, poor areas of the world, they're doing without. And the statistics are really quite stunning. A recent UN report that was reported in The Guardian um, said that right now at least three, uh, three billion people are living in water-stressed areas of the world, but other UN reports say that within five to ten years it could be as many as two-thirds of the world's population living with water stress because every couple of decades the water itself is going, like the water table is going down. The climate is a common good, belonging to all and meant for all. The Climate Action Network is a non-governmental organization which functions as an umbrella for 120 member organizations concerned with climate change. The membership comes from every corner of progressive civil society in Canada, like humanitarian organizations, labor unions, and faith groups. Catherine Abreu, the executive director, discusses the impact of global warming. So when we take a look at the kinds of environmental problems that are facing us today in Canada, climate change is of course top of the list. Uh, we know that on average the world has warmed by about one degree Celsius. But in Canada, that rate of warming is faster than the global average. We are seeing warming here in Canada about twice that rate. So Canada has warmed by about two degrees on average in the last number of decades. And in the north, that rate of warming is tripled. So we've seen three degrees of warming in the north of Canada. 
our landscape is changing dramatically before us and that is fundamentally altering the way in which Canadians can live in various parts of the country and in particular it's really altering the ability of indigenous communities to provide for themselves to interact with their traditions and to take advantage of their local food supplies. Because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God. We're probably losing on average about 175 unique species every day. Which when you think about, you know, that's just an incredible number of species we're losing. Many people believe that this is we're really at the beginnings of the sixth great mass extinction of life on the planet. Um, so that's quite incredible that we as one species, and really when you think about it, it's mainly uh, a small percentage of humans in the way we live that's causing the majority of the species loss. How we've had such an impact on the planet. Uh, and each species plays a unique role, uh, is the fruit of millions of years of evolution from a theological point of view, a unique expression of the creator. Um, and as species disappear, the, the, the web of life grows weaker. I mean, each species has, has its own role and you can only lose so many before ecosystems start getting affected as well, particularly with keystone species, you know. Uh, just to give an example of that, we know, for instance, in the Pacific Northwest, salmon uh, play a key role in the health of the rainforest. Uh, when salmon start disappearing, it, traditionally what happened is when there was the salmon run, uh, bears would, and eagles and other animals would, would prey upon the salmon. They leave the carcasses of the salmon in the forest. Uh, and that was really the key fertilizer. It was a way of moving nutrients from the sea to the forest. And if you look at the tree rings of these trees now, you'll see that since uh, over the last century, the salmon fishery has grown. The tree rings, the growth rings on the trees are no longer as large, I and mean, they're not growing as much as they were. Uh, so that's just an example of how losing one species can affect an entire ecosystem. As this film is being edited, the world is in the midst of a global pandemic, the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic. It is the worst pandemic since the Spanish flu of 1918. With the emergence of diseases spread from animals to humans, or zoonotic diseases, scientists have concluded that there is a connection between the loss of biodiversity and the emergence of viruses like COVID-19. Well, in 2006, you know, I found one article was, you know, was where the author was telling that you know, a global pandemic, uh, which can really cause havoc around the world, is, and the other was saying it's like a, like a time bomb, we are just ticking. 2006 they said that. And we know that we have had the Ebola, we have had SARS, we have had MERS, you know, they were all, all warnings from, from the natural world. Like, you know, that, I mean, if the planet is not healthy, we cannot be healthy. And deforestation is, is you know, and there are thousands and thousands of these viruses, you know, we find them in the animals, but they can be passed on to the humans. And Ebola was a case of that, and SARS and MERS, and the latest is a, is a COVID-19. So, the, and, and what struck me was, you know, scientists, you know, even 15 years ago, they were, yeah, 2006 or so, they began to speak about it, you know. And, and, and I, don't, I don't think COVID-19 will be the last. I mean, probably we, we might be wiser in controlling better the outbreak of the next pandemic. But then uh, if, if we keep on destroying our ecosystems, you know, those diseases, those viruses are, 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 are going to catch on to us. And, and, and if I might repeat, I mean, it's again, I think that's the you know, running thread of the Laudato that everything is connected. You know, if, so if the ecosystems are not healthy, don't expect us to be healthy. A July 2020 report by the United Nations Environment Program reported that the increase in zoonotic pandemics is a result of the destruction of natural habitats like rainforests. 
que há duas causas principais que han provocado muitos vírus, como eh, a, a Zika, Chikungunya, eh, a SARS e outros que vieram. Se deve fundamentalmente a duas razões, a meu juízo. Primeiro, a urbanização do mundo. Porque 83% da humanidade vive em cidades. Já não conhece a natureza. Então, se han acercado demasiado, han deforestado, han ocupado todos os espaços. Que é uma razão. O outro, o agronegócio, ha avançado sobre as, as florestas, os bosques, especialmente a Amazonia, que é terrível. E se han acercado, então, eh, demasiadamente a esses sítios onde vivem milhões e milhões de bactérias e vírus que se sentiram agredidos e han buscado em ser humano um outro hábitat, porque nós hemos destruído o hábitat deles, que estavam aí tranquilos, milhares de anos em seus hábitats. Hemos destruído isso e han passado ao ser humano para encontrar uma célula com as células com a qual vive. Disse muito bem os astronautas que vêm na Terra desde a Luna ou desde suas naves espaciais, dizem desde acá não há diferença Terra e humanidade. É uma coisa só. Então, Terra e humanidade é uma unidade compleja e nós somos parte dessa natureza. Eu diria mais que somos aquella porción de la tierra que en un dado momento de su complejidad empezó a sentir, empezó a pensar, empezó a amar y a cuidar y ahí irrumpió el ser humano. Por eso que hombre, homo, viene de humus, tierra buena. Entonces somos tierra, tierra que piensa, tierra que siente, tierra que ama. Pero eso fue olvidado. Era una idea de todas las culturas antiguas. Siempre se entendía la tierra como la gran madre, Magna Mater, Pachamama, Tonantzin, Nana. Algo vivo, del cual recibimos todo. The second step of the three-step process is judging, or discerning the extent of the crisis facing our common home and reflecting on it in the light of Judeo-Christian values. In her 2016 book, Boiling Point, Maud Barlow examines the commodification of water by private sector interests around the world. She coins the phrase, water justice. So the, the notion of water justice is very much based on the concept of the right to water as opposed to um, a, a charity issue. It's, and, and you know, it wasn't included in the 1948 um, Declaration on Human Rights because nobody thought at the time that water was an issue. But it's a huge issue now and it really is a, an important lens to clear up, you know, when we're looking at it to say that this is a fundamental right and that no one should have to watch their child die of waterborne disease because they can't afford bought water. In his book, The Ten Green Commandments, Father Caritha Dam writes, our judgment of the crisis reveals that the abuse of the natural world on the part of humanity is nothing less than sinful behavior. The fourth green commandment is therefore about the concept of ecological sin. When I cause climate crisis, and my poor brothers and sisters in, uh, in Bangladesh suffer. And God doesn't want us to mistreat creation. So it is an ecological sin. When I cause a species to go into extinction and uh, God's glory is lessened, and uh, obviously the indigenous communities, for example, suffer on account of that. When I go and build a dam there, or I, 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 I mine, you know, I start, a mine, mine, I start a mining company there and indigenous people are pulled out, pushed out. Now, all those are what we call ecological sins. 
And uh, I would conclude by saying that ecological sin needs to be understood in the context of salvation, that we just don't s just save ourselves. We just don't save, not even we as Christians, we save ourselves with the entire creation. We're in a situation right now globally where we know that in order to hold off the most destructive and irreversible impacts of climate change that we need to be holding average global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And the world scientists tell us that in order to do that, we need to be cutting global emissions in half by 2030 and getting them to zero by 2050. And that means there is no more room for the ongoing expansion of oil and gas production. It also means that those countries that have the most the most destructive oil, i.e. the highest emitting oil in the world, um, and that have the greatest ability to explore other sectors for prosperity and job creation, need to be moving away from oil and gas production first. And guess what? Canada falls right into that category. Our oil is some of the highest emitting in the world. And while there are communities in Canada that rely very much on the oil and gas industry and who we have to think about as we're transitioning away from that um, fossil fuel dependence, for the most part, the Canadian economy can adapt away from an oil and gas industry. Oil and gas is responsible for under 10% of the GDP in Canada. That means we can chart a transition away from oil and gas in this country. We can think about uh, how we are going to be building the sectors of our economy, the industries that will be um, the source of clean, good jobs in the future, rather than continuing to double down on a polluting industry that we know is volatile and that we cannot count on to give us the prosperity and jobs that we're currently counting on it for into the future. In this third and final step of the methodology, we arrive at acting. Based on understanding the issues facing our common home, judging them in the light of Judeo-Christian values, we now have the option to act. In this last segment of the film, we will witness examples of robust action to both adapt to and to mitigate or change the circumstances of our climate crisis. On September 1, 2019, 64 congregations of women religious in Canada, both English and French, issued a joint statement calling on the country's political leaders to respond to the climate emergency by taking steps to avert it. They published this statement inspired by Laudato Si with the support of the International Union of Superiors General, the UISG. In their words, as women religious, caring for all God's creation is an essential part of our faith. Uh, it served so many purposes. It added the diversity of voices, and yet we worked on one common statement together. Um, and I think really that is going forward what we need to be doing, acting as collectives and not only doing our own statements separately. You know, the idea of emergency got a little bit of um, airtime in our conversations before the statement was crafted. And some people felt that emergency was not a helpful word. A little bit of this idea of the urgent can hijack the important and get people almost paralyzed. Um, we kept it in the statement, but we also used the statement climate collapse, um, simply wanting to point out this is dire and we can have capacity to do something about it together. The statement lists seven robust actions that congregations of women religious have taken to combat the destruction of our planet. First on the list is the act of divesting congregational stock market portfolios from fossil fuels to clean and renewable energy projects. I know that many congregations throughout Canada and beyond Canada, of course, have done that. Um, and so we were inspired by them and decided that it was time to act. But it's something that I think many congregations are looking at or have already done. Our motivation actually comes from love of the earth. That's the ultimate motivation of it. Do we think it will make an impact? Yes, we do. We think that if there are enough groups and individuals also shifting away from fossil fuels, that it actually adds more energy to renewable sources. And, and we know this is already beginning to happen. 
Another action is a commitment to the Blue Communities Project, which entails treating water as a sacred resource and shared commons. Maud Barlow, who was part of the team that started the project, explains. But instead of being against something, we decided to have a project that was positive. And the concept at the time, we only thought of it for municipalities and for only Canadian municipalities. We have dozens of Canadian municipalities now that are blue communities, and they agree to protect water as a human right, um, to protect it as a public trust, so no privatization, and to do away with phase out bottled water on municipal premises and at municipal events. And it's very exciting, it's spreading across the country, but then it started to spread to other uh, cities around the world. But it also started to move into universities. University of Montreal uh, is, a, is a blue community uh, and faith-based groups. Um, the sisters, the religious sisters here in Canada have taken it on big time. So has the World Council of Churches, which became a blue community three years ago and has really promoted the whole notion of water as a human right and what is one called to do. I'll speak personally from our, uh, our Federation of the Sisters of St. Joseph. About three years ago, we're meeting and somebody mentioned Blue Community and we read something about it. And it was such a fascinating process that the group of us representing three congregations together within one hour had decided we were going to do this together. And the follow-up with that was not just signing a pledge, which is fine, we hired someone have time to um, work with us doing education, not only within the congregation, but way beyond the congregation. And interestingly, we're just uh, in the process of hiring this person for more hours because we think it is something that religious congregations can offer beyond ourselves. Um, and that education piece is so important. A rise in the sea level, for example, can create extremely serious situations if we consider that a quarter of the world's population lives on the coast or nearby, and that the majority of our megacities are situated in coastal areas. Halifax, a coastal city on the Atlantic, is actively engaged in responding to climate change with an ambitious plan called Halifax 2050 whose goal is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050 by retrofitting city buildings, by adding renewable energy sources, improving public transit to shift away from single-use passenger cars, and adapting to a problem like sea level rise. Rising sea levels and more frequent storms have had a damaging impact on shoreline structures on the northwest arm, a waterway on the south side of the city but the city has been working to adapt. Halifax is experiencing sea level rise and we have been for some time and we, we track it and we also predict what's going to happen in the future. We're also subsiding uh, as a landmass so that's causing um, even kind of higher levels. The seawall uh, along the northwest arm in, in Fleming Park was in a state of disrepair from some continuous damage from the ocean from you know storm storms and high, high winds and strong waves. And so something needed to be done. And they, they came up with a solution, which is natural granite uh, wall, um, because they knew it would be strong enough. They didn't have to raise it as high as if it had been some other types of materials. And it, you, know, you can have waves over top it, and it, it allowed uh, you know, us not to have to put a giant railing up along the water. It's just a path that everybody can enjoy and go down to the beach. Uh, and it was really well, well received by the community. Net zero by 2050 is achievable if everybody truly commits to it. And I think a real, a real hallmark of this climate plan was the stakeholder engagement and really approaching all of the work through a lens of equity and inclusion because on the adaptation side, we know that our vulnerable populations and communities experience the negative impacts of climate first and worst. And so we really wanna make sure that we're designing our programs and our policies and, and all of the work that we do with that, with that in mind and making sure that we prioritize those most vulnerable first and foremost. Faith and the Common Good is a national interfaith network dedicated to assisting and inspiring religious congregations and spiritual groups of all backgrounds to take collective action in creating more sustainable communities concerned with energy efficiency, saving our ecosystem, and climate justice. Every 
faith community speaks to the responsibility of taking care of the planet that we live on. And it was one of the, um, the inspirations for the Green Rule poster that was created by Faith in the Common Good. It was also inspired by the Golden Rule poster that was created by Scarborough Missions. Really what we wanted to show, to show the common theme um, around caring for our environment. Uh, and that's essentially why it is multi multi-faith. It's intentionally intercultural, interfaith, multi-faith in our organization and objectives because that reflects the Canadian landscape. Laudato C is both filled with inspiration and action. At Faith of the Common Good, we have two Catholic programs underneath uh, our umbrella. One is Caring for Our Common Home, and the second is the Global Climate Catholic Movement, the Canadian chapter. Both of these use Laudato C as the inspiration for the programming that they develop. One significant partnership forged by Faith and the Common Good is the Faithful Footprints Project with the United Church of Canada. This is a national program run by the United Church that offers grants and support to congregations to reduce their carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. So our first focus will be to engage with 500 congregations by 2025 to improve the energy efficiency of their buildings and to share lessons they can take into their homes and workplaces. The cry of the earth and the cry of the poor are really one cry. And this theme, expressed so clearly in Laudato Si, is echoed by the Climate Action Network's campaign for a just recovery after the economic devastation of COVID-19 and a Green New Deal. So scientists, climate activists, and people of faith are calling us to hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor together. This campaign put forward six guiding principles that should inform all government's actions as they continue to respond to and then build back from the COVID-19 pandemic. And these are principles that are about putting human rights human dignity and the rights and the well-being of the natural world first, about putting people over profit, putting people and the planet over profit. Um, the Just Recovery work builds on the work that we were already really involved in in the Green New Deal campaign. And the Green New Deal campaign in the US and Canada, now in the EU and many European countries, we've been seeing it really spread like wildfire around the world, is a process that looks at developing policies to confront climate change and other ecological crises at hand in a way that's about putting people at the center. Father Caritha Dem concludes his book with the 10th Green Commandment, which is to cultivate ecological virtues. And he reflects on the first and the last of these virtues. Uh, the first virtue is praise, and that is the spirit of Laudato Si. May God be praised. And the last virtue is humility. And humus in Latin is Adama in Hebrew, that we return to Mother Earth. And I think humility is the mother of all ecological virtues. That when we return to the Earth with humility, as Adama, as children, as earthlings, we will care for the earth with the love of children as for a mother.